Good evening, friends. Steve Manoon here with Israeli News Live. And uh, some information I want to share with you today is it's going to seem kind of common, but yet at the same time, I think we're going to learn something a little deeper than what we're used to, um, which is kind of the way, the direction I normally like to go in the first place. I like to be able to really uh, go deep and share things with you guys on a deep level. So, um, I'm going to try to do that today, and, uh, and uh, we're going to get started on this video here. So I want to take you to Luke's Gospel, the fourth chapter. And before we get started here, I want to just say a simple prayer that, that perhaps this will be truly a blessing for those of you that are listening. Heavenly Father, we just really humbly come before you, and we ask, Father, that your, your spirit of love that divine love that comes from the Father above, that you would take and place that in everyone's heart that's listening today, that you would draw us closer to you. In Jesus Christ's name we pray, amen. And I pray also that he open our hearts and our minds to the things I'm going to be sharing with you. Listen here, we're going to go right into the... Um, we're going to go into Luke, as I said, for fourth chapter, 18th verse. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He closed the book, he gave it again to the minister, and sat down, and the eyes of all them were in the synagogue, were fastened on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Now, if you remember, this is where Jesus goes into a synagogue, and they bring him the, the scroll of Isaiah, hand him the book. He reads part of the prophecy of Isaiah. And if we're looking at Isaiah, he actually preaches... Uh, the first, uh, he actually quotes the first verse, half of the second verse, but does not go into the day of vengeance of our God or to comfort all that mourn, which we clearly know represents a future event. But as I begin to prepare a message on faith, which was what I really wanted to teach on today, uh, I begin to realize. There's more to Isaiah 61 than what we realize in the first place. What Jesus really did when he read this verse here. He was anointed to bring good tidings unto the humble. He says, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted to proclaim liberty to the captives. In the opening of the eyes to them that are bound. I don't know if you guys realize this or not, but even the fulfillment of First Peter, you remember over here in First Peter where we find out, Peter says here, for Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing wherein few that is eight souls were saved by water the like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us not the putting away the filth of the flesh but the answering of a good conscience towards God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ in other words what Peter wrote in his gospel there, or his epistle, is a fulfillment of opening the eyes to them that are bound. Or perhaps even the proclaiming the liberty to the captives. Think about that. You see, death is not the end per se at least in the case of what we read here, of the prophecy of Isaiah and the fulfillment thereof in the times when Jesus was here on this earth. 
It says there that he also, he, he has set, set to bind up the brokenhearted. That literally, if you look in Luke, I like the translation of Luke better, to heal the brokenhearted. And that had everything to do with redemption. The brokenhearted is those not just because you are depressed, but because our soul had need of his own life coming inside of us. If you remember, I just taught recently about that very issue there, about the love of Almighty God, how to receive the Holy Spirit. And it had everything to do with actually healing that of a broken heart. Our souls are broken. No wonder why Jesus had to go, not just to the souls that were imprisoned from the time of Noah's flood, but all the way down through, all right? I want to show that to you. Think about what it says in the book of Hebrews here, right? Let's back it up. Very first verse, now faith is a substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report through faith. We understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. If we drop down to verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Sometimes people, you know, when it comes to, say, like, for example, divine healing. Divine healing, by the way, the healing of the body is what God did, or what Christ did, I should say, when he was here on the earth. It's basically what he used and what he taught his apostles to use in order to get the people to believe for the healing of their heart. So he would heal outside the norm. He would heal outside the medical science of his day. And oddly, in some of the writings that are out there that are attributed to the apostles, but yet are not part of the canon. And so I don't encourage you to take that and look at that as part of the canon, but I would say it from, from just a historical fact that is written in there. There's actually in one place where he says specifically that. He tells his disciples, heal those sick among you first. Heal the body so that they will know that you can heal the heart. And really and truly what he means when he says heal the heart, that is so that you know what it takes for that person's heart or their soul to become quickened. And to become one with the Father. So as I read these things and I see this, you know, and I know faith, as it says the very first sentence there, faith is the substance of things hoped for. It's the evidence of things that are not seen. For it by the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the world will... The worlds were framed by the word of God, <clears throat> so the things which are, are seen were not made of things which do appear. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts. Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Okay, Noah, being warned of God, things not, uh, not seen as of yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to, for the saving of his house. Abraham, when he was called to go into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing whether he went. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and the heirs with him of the same promise. That kind of like be like today, somebody taking and living in their car with their kids. And let's say maybe they, they, they left California they came east and they believe in their heart that God has sent them here to, towards the east because of the calamity that may be coming towards California. And so by faith, they left their place believing that God is going to provide for them a place in the east here. 
And like Abraham, they're just moving about from one little campground to another little campground, maybe living in this little part of the woods to another little part in the woods and everything. But they're believing God that he's going to provide a place for them. I will say to you, don't give up. Because God will provide that place. You see, your words are what matter to our Heavenly Father. What you say and what you think is what you believe. And you don't just say it just to say it. You have to believe what you say to be true. You know, I'll show you, for example... If you were to, I will show you how just, I want to just show you how powerful words are and your thoughts are. This, and this can apply to anything and everything you can ever possibly imagine in your life when it comes to faith. When you, when you begin to, let's say, for example, you get to thinking and you begin to reminisce in your mind and you think about a time, uh, let's say you haven't had a certain food in a long time. And uh, we'll say it's one of your favorite types of meals. And, and you begin to think about that. And it's been a long time since you ate that food there. And I, I don't know what food that might would be. But let's, let's just say, like, for example, a fruit, for example. Let's say watermelon. You like watermelon. You like cold watermelon. You like watermelon with seeds in it. And, 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 and maybe you get to thinking about that. And the season is not yet, but you know the season is coming near. And you just begin to think about that. And as you begin to reminisce about watermelon, how good it was last year, you got it from a certain, certain place, your mouth will begin to water. You will actually begin to taste that watermelon in your mouth, and yet you don't even have it in your mouth. You can go... There, there, let me put it like this here. The things that we think about create an atmosphere. And I'll prove this to you as well. Men out there that go to, because it goes in both directions, good and bad. You begin to lust after some woman. The next thing you know, it begins to consume you and to overtake you and your body begins to react based on your very thoughts. You see, Satan can use your thoughts for evil just like they're meant to be used for good. Same thing you can take, for example, a guy can get so angry at, at, at a neighbor. Maybe they did something to offend you or hurt you or something like that or they said something towards your wife or or, or you thought they were looking at your children or, or, I mean, anything. And maybe they weren't, but I'm just saying, just to give you an idea. And you can get so worked up in your mind that the next thing you know, you're on the verge of carrying out an act against that individual. And maybe they're not even guilty of what you're thinking about. See, the mind is very powerful. The thoughts and the meditation. That's why, in fact, there's a scripture about that. And I think that's what it's called. Let me just see if I can pull that up real quick. The meditation. Um, I think that's where Paul speaks about that. The meditation, the things that are upon your heart. Let me just see. Um, let, the, let, the, let the meditation. Let's see. Hmm. It's not, it's not the way I was thinking of it. Um, uh, oh gosh, I cannot think of it right off the top of my hand. I thought I'd pull it up. I put it pulling up the word meditation. But I think it's something to do with the meditation of our minds upon him. And uh, man, let's see here. Let me just see if it pulls up with, well, I'm actually misspelling it now. Meditate. Um, I may have had it right. Let's see. The heart shall meditate to Let's see here. What you shall answer. That's a good one too where Jesus says that meditate upon these things. Uh, maybe it's First Timothy. Let me just look here real quick at this one here. Neglect not the gift that is in you which was given you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the presbyter 
meditate upon these things and give yourself wholly to them that you that you profiting may appear to all take heed unto yourself and to the doctrine and continue in them that's still not what i'm looking for hmm. Jeez, I really wanted to show that with you there. Let's see, meditation. Let me go back to meditation because maybe I'd actually misspelled it. No, I didn't. Anyway, I'll just have to skip it for now. But the thing is, is it's what we think about, what our minds are on. Let you know, our minds should be upon the Lord. And I realize you have to have your mind on work, et cetera, things like that. You might have to be a mother. You might have to have your mind on the kids and things like that, too. Uh, and, and that is very true. And th those things are needful. But remember, Satan also wants to use your mind as a playground. And I want to just share with you. I'm going to kind of go back. I'm kind of jumping around. I didn't mean to do that. I really didn't want to do that today. But let me just look at some of these here with you. By faith he showed, sojourned in the land of promises in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. You know, if you're out there and you're, you're a, 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 a sister, you're married, you, you, you're husband and you don't have any kids and you want a child and you've been praying and you've been asking God that, you know, you say, Lord, we'd like to have a child, you know, Let me tell you what you do. Faith is a substance of things hoped for. Go out, buy the crib, buy the booties, buy the clothes for the child. And do not confess, Lord, I want a child. If you've already asked him and said, Lord, I want a child, I want you to change your approach a little bit and I want you to start thanking God for the child that God is going to give you and your husband. You see, the faith is a substance. Faith, literally, it, it takes a hold and it believes those things that you cannot see with your natural eyes. I want you to believe it. And I want you to hold on to it. And I don't want you to doubt. I want you to hold on to it. No matter what the odds look like, no matter what anybody else has got to say, no matter how crazy they think you are, you believe it anyway. It's the same thing for divine healing. You know, when I pray for the sick, and I don't normally talk about these things, but I'm going to share with you uh, just a testimony or two, just to show you how that faith works. I remember one time years ago, it was down in uh, Florida near, uh, oh gosh, I want to say it was around Sandestin, somewhere in that area there, uh, maybe even closer to Panama City. I don't remember exactly where. But I, I had a delivery company at the time, and besides doing uh, copiers and medical equipment, we also did musical instruments. And in this particular case, uh, I was asked to go and deliver a particular instrument. It was a very large organ, uh, like a triple keyboard to this lady, but it went into a home where things just wouldn't fit very well. And the other delivery company that was down in that area was unsuccessful getting it in. And so they asked if I would go. And so I did. And of course, I show up by myself, which when I got there, the lady was looking at me like I was a nutcase for even showing up because they had left it there. But I guess they, if I remember right, they left it in the living room. And she said, you might as well just go back and tell them you tried, but you couldn't get it in. And so I asked her, I said, um, I said, now, would you want me to lie to you? And she said, oh, no, I wouldn't want you to lie to me. I said, I said, no, ma'am. I said, neither do I want to lie to them. I said, now, if you don't want it, I said, I have no problem. I'll load it up, take it back. I said, but let me just be honest with them. And uh, I said, but I believe we can get it in there. So, and she said, but you're by yourself. I said, it doesn't make any difference. I said, whether I'm by myself or not. I said, but I don't consider myself by myself. I said, Everywhere I go, the Lord goes with me. I said, so he makes things real easy for me to do it. Well, sure enough, I moved this thing as if it was God himself just levitating it and putting it in there. It was really crazy. I mean, in fact, later 
when the lady ends up sending it back later, it's kind of funny because she decided she didn't want it. But when she sent it back later, I struggled to get this thing back out of the room that it went in like as if it was nothing. But then I realized later what happened. God was was wanting this woman to really to believe, right? He was working on her faith already. And I did not even realize that God was working on this lady's faith. So I go back later. I get called back later and uh, to remove it, maybe a week or so later. And when I went there this time, the lady, uh, of course, she was an older woman. and I, I, I don't know her age exactly. I would say late 60s, maybe early 70s. Uh, her and her husband, very, very sweet couple. And uh, I remember when I went back there, the uh, lady was not in the room, just her husband. And so as I was trying to struggle to get the thing out of the room, really having a difficult time, I asked about his wife. I said, how's your wife doing? Well, he then proceeds to tell me that she was dying of cancer. Uh, she had, a, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was colon cancer. And I said, I'm very sorry to hear this. And... Um, and so I said, would, would she, if she'd be willing, I said, I'd really enjoy to be able to speak with her for just a little bit. So she came out, and when she did, we sat together there in the living room, and I began to talk to her. And, uh, and I, wanted, I was working with her on faith, is what I was working with her on. And I began to tell her different testimonies of, of things that I had seen uh, you know, things, uh, healings that I'd heard of and also healings that I had seen God do. You know, I'd seen the Lord raise the dead. I'd seen the Lord heal the blind. Uh, and in both cases, my own mother was, uh, was one of the ones that this happened with. But as I began to talk to her about these things, I shared that those things with her. And then suddenly something came over me and I knew she had believed. And when I realized she had believed, I stopped speaking and I prayed for her. And when I prayed for her, I told her as before I left, I said, now, you're going to get very sick in a few days. I said, because I'll explain it to you like this here. I said, as a Christian, as a believer, I said, Jesus gave us authority to cast out evil spirits. I said, if you've got cancer, whether it's a tumor or whatever the case may be, I said, by his authority, I've been given that permission to cast that spirit out, or that, in which that spirit is what's giving life to that cancer, which is trying to take your life. I said, but just like an animal that's been killed on the side of the road when it got hit by a car, I said, the life went out of the animal. I said, but a few days later, it begins to, to bloat. Rigor mortis sets in, etc. What's happening? I said, everything's breaking that body down and it's going to then dissipate, come to nothing. I said, but in the human body, it's the white, I said, the cancer swells up then the white blood cells attack it, break it down, and then the body will take and disperse it out. I said, so you'll get very sick. I said, but just do one thing for me. I said, when you get sick, I said, that's when I need you to really believe. I said, do not lose faith that Jesus Christ has already made you well. And I told her, I said, because I know you're healed already. I said, I already know you are. I said, but don't lose faith. I said, because it, you, you'll go through that. I said, but after a few days, that'll pass. And you'll see what I told you to be the truth. Well, odd thing is, I ended up, I didn't think I'd ever go back down that way, right? Odd thing is, about a week later, I ended up back down in the same area again for another reason altogether. And while I was there, I stopped at this little store, but I remember that the store was very near to where this couple lived at. <clears throat> so I thought, I got to go back and see how they're doing. Kind of like Paul, you know, they said, let's go back and see how they do, right? So I went and I took and I found their place and I didn't, I just kind of knew it by memory. And so I knocked on the door and when I did, her husband opens the door and he was so elated. He said, Steve, oh my gosh, I can't believe you're here. Come on in. So I came in and when I did, I remember uh, his wife, she sat there and they, they began to tell me the story. And this time he's telling the story, right? He's telling this beautiful story. 
He said, Steve, you don't realize how sick my wife was. But he said, the doctors had given her up. They had sent her home to die. And he said, there was nothing else they could do for her. And he said, uh, when you prayed for my wife and you told her three days, it's going to get really bad. He said, sure enough. And then she kind of took over the testimony. She said, on the third day, I got very sick, just like you told me I would. She said, it was so bad, Steve. She said, if I wasn't a Christian, I would have took and shot myself. She said, that's how bad it got. But she said, I remembered what you told me. She said, you said, don't lose faith. And she said, so I called for my husband and I asked him to come in the room and she said, and I asked him, please pray for me. And he prayed for me. And she said, then I finally, I fell asleep a little later. Said the next morning I got up and I started cleaning the house. And her husband then kind of took over the testimony. He said, she cleaned all day long, Steve. He said, but what you have to understand he said she had been so sick, we had to sleep in separate bedrooms because she didn't want to disturb my sleep so I could work. And he said my wife had not been able to clean our home in about a year. He said her pain was always so great and her suffering was so great at this point of her illness that she chose to sleep in another room. He said, but I watched her that day and she cleaned the whole day. And by early afternoon, he said she had finished. He said, I walked in the room with her. And I said, because she comes to me and she says, you know, she said, I'm a little tired. I think I'm going to go ahead and go lay down for a little while, go to sleep. He said, and I said to her, he said, honey, you don't realize what just happened today, do you? And she said, what do you mean? He said, um, have you taken your medication? She stopped. She said, no. He said, when's the last time you were able to clean? And she thought for a moment and she started crying. He said, God healed you. And sure enough, she was totally well. Faith is a real substance. But it begins with your own testimony. Remember what Jesus said? If you have the faith of the grain of a mustard seed, if you were to say to this mountain, be ye therefore moved and cast into the sea, by and by it will obey what you said. So what we say, what we confess, what we communicate matters. I could tell you hundreds of testimonies like that. And, but the thing is, I'm wanting you to believe. We are, listen, friends, we're getting in a late air hour. But I want to read this part to you as well, because I want to go back to the Isaiah 61. All right, let's start with verse 11, though. We're still in the book of Hebrews, chapter 8. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed, talking about a child, and was delivered of a child when she was past age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore sprang there even one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars, the sky, and multitude, as the sand which is by the seashore innumerable, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them and embraced them and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. Did you notice that? True believers aren't from this earth. This is not our home. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. I want to be with you. I'm sure you do as well. 
But he goes on, he says, having seen them afar off, they were persuaded of them, embraced them, confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country. That is an heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. He's prepared for us a city. Notice, though, that they, they died believing that promise. See that? These all died in faith, not having received the promises. This is what Isaiah 61 is all about. This one that would have the Spirit of the Lord upon them. I can't help but believe because I do know that the, the, uh, the, 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 the Bible of the Hebrew version that was found in Syria. I'll, I'll leave that alone for now. We'll go into that later. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to bring good tidings unto the humble. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted or heal the brokenhearted. That was those that had need of the Holy Spirit. That was the promise. That is redemption. You see, they died needing it and they had not received it yet. Over there in 1 Peter, where Jesus, uh, Peter writes about Jesus going to the captives and preaching to them, that's only one part of it. You know, Jesus also went down and he brought back those that were captive. He came to proclaim liberty to the captives. See, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, all of them, they died believing in these promises but had not received them. But they never wavered in their faith, believing it. They saw them afar off. They were persuaded of them. Notice, though, too. See, this is what's beautiful. Abraham was looking for a city whose builder and maker was God, right? Verse 10. It has foundations. And then we find out that that city is a heavenly city. Where was it at? We just read it just a second. Here it is right there. Here it is. It was a heavenly. That is an heavenly country. So Isaiah 61 had to be fulfilled in the opening of eyes to them that are bound that, I believe, is First Peter's right there. They were bound because in the long days of Noah, they didn't see. They couldn't see what he was saying. Jesus also dealt with that with the Jews of his day. They were blind. And Jesus even said at one point, if the blind lead the blind, let them alone. They'll both fall in the ditch. But we, by faith, we, by faith, believe the promise. Listen, I'm really geared in my heart more and more to bring messages to you of faith, of believing to prepare our souls because the things that are coming upon this earth, the fearful sights and things that are going to be coming, we need to be ready for. We need to be ready To answer the call. If you're sick in your body and you've got any kind of wavering disease, anything like that, you need me to pray for you, I will pray for you. And I'm going to pray for you even now. But when I pray for you now, you, the greatest thing you can do for God is to believe him that he's already healed you. You will need to confess, yes, you're sick. 
yes, you have this or whatever you may have, but I want from this day forward, after you make those confessions, I want you to begin to say that you are healed. And as you confess that, the very cells in your body will react. Your body will begin to change and the things, whatever is causing you, I don't care if you're in a crippled in a wheelchair. You begin to confess, I am healed. God has given me the ability to walk. God will make your body obey what you say. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray for those that are listening today, Father. I ask that you would heal their bodies, Father. That you will mend them, Lord. That you said that these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. Lord, heal the sick, dear God. I pray, Father God, this is what you commanded your believers to do. Pray for the sick. You told the believers to heal the sick. And it's not that we're healers, Lord. But if we can get the people to believe you, your word, your promise, the work that Jesus Christ did by his stripes, you were made well. Then, Father God, you'll take care of everything else. So I pray for them today in the name of Jesus Christ that no matter what it is they have need of in their physical body, also, Lord, if they have need, Father, in their homes, maybe their home is broken, maybe husband has left or wife has left or something of that nature there, Father, that you'll restore the home if the person is asking for restoration of their homes, Father. I pray if they're praying for loved ones that are lost, Lord, that you'll wake those loved ones up and bring them back into the fold, Father. I pray, Lord, if it's a, if there's financial needs, many people have them right now, Father, because of the way things are crumbling in around us, Father, but that you will provide the work and the financial needs that are necessary. And I pray, Father God, that the, that those that are that hear my voice about that, Lord, same thing applies. Believe it. Speak it. That God has first admit that you have the need, but then speak it and say, Father, I believe it now that you have already supplied the needs that we have for our family. I ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you. Thank you for listening. And I'll be speaking to you again very soon. We have a very amazing interview I'm going to be doing very soon. I don't want to say who it's with, but it's going to shock you. Stephen Benin with Israeli News Live. Good evening.